Through decades, the early modern scholarship strove to present how different elements of the Baroque cultural heritage influenced our time. This heritage was mainly visible in the field of philosophy, in the sphere of the visual arts, or in the arts of theater and urban planning. However, all these diverse legacies were usually viewed only as mere precursors of later developments that these fields of human endeavor underwent in the 19th century in the great dawn of the modern world. The role of the Baroque thus often seemed important but indirect, and was perceived as the period that rarely left more than a fleeting shadow in our present. But these are not the only legacies that the Baroque bestowed upon us. There is also a less visible but equally significant heritage that endured through centuries and still defines greatly the way we perceive the world. It is particularly evident in two fundamental concepts, those of time and space, that experienced such a pivotal change in the age of the Baroque. There is almost no period in the history of culture which was so profoundly marked by time in all its different manifestations, from the time as a great destroyer to the eight temporal of heavenly realms. But, above all, a complex experience of different temporal domains and a changed notion of the past most influenced our understanding of temporality. The prospect of existing in different times simultaneously opened almost endless possibilities for our own existence, while a completely novel view of the past shaped greatly our own relationship to time, from fixed and immutable. The past in the Baroque world suddenly became a changeable, rewritable, and mealable category. Equally complex and equally elaborate was the Baroque understanding of space. With its rich varieties of liminal worlds, of meta-spaces and shadowy lands that populated the world of the 17th and 18th centuries, the notion of space seamlessly complemented the temporal profusion that opened in front of the Baroque man. Both temporal and spatial plurality presents the hidden legacy that in our time could be well perceived in the field of contemporary literature. They're particularly pronounced in the highly complex landscapes of time and the liminal worlds they create in their narratives. Today, I would like to present a true space between disciplines, a veritable liminal realm. It is the curious liminal space that exists between contemporary literature and Baroque visual culture in the work of a German writer, W.G. Sebald, and his book, The Rings of Saturn. The Rings of Saturn by W.G. Sebald is truly a hybrid work, as hybrid as Baroque culture itself was. It is simultaneously the composition of memoir, travel book, a visual document, and a fiction. Sebald himself claimed that his literature does not belong to any fixed category, but that it unites all of them, in the same way that many Baroque artworks evade usual classification and transcend genres, becoming the hybrids of different arts and media. Hybridity was um, not just the former characteristic of Baroque art, but it also resided in the very essence of the then contemporary cultural idiom. It gave it the much needed flexibility and power of amalgamation that transformed the arts of Baroque from purely European into a first true global phenomenon. This almost Baroque hybridity is even more pronounced on the temporal level in the rings of Saturn. Zebold's book constantly overlaps the past and the present, the time evoked and the time perceived. It stands between memory of fiction between record and recollection. Its narrative consists out of several constantly overlapping entities, that of personal observation, the realm of a documentary, and the one of historical study. The entire book is composed as a pseudo-documentary record, partly real, partly fictional, of an almost pilgrimage walk along the coast of Norfolk and Suffolk. It is the book that uses movement, time, and nature as its key leitmotifs. The elements that, as it would be presented, figured greatly in the arts and culture of the Baroque age. Zebold commences each of his chapters 
on the level of the real, tangible presence, with an almost topographically precise rendering of the space or landscape, often underlined with visual material that you can see on the screen, uh, that subsequently engenders a personal recollection. The landscape thus becomes the stage where different pasts, both real and imaginary, cherished or forgotten, emerge. These recollections are as hybrid and fragmentary as the book itself is. They are consisted out of the fragments of memory and shards of the past that are as real for the as a coastal landscape that the narrator walks through. The hybridity of both form and content is even more prominent in Zabel's use of photographic material in his work. All the photos, regardless of their subject matter, have the semblance of the documentary or archival material, but like the text itself, they're presenting to us a false authenticity. With its black and white coloring, the creased and worn surfaces, they're created to deceive the reader in believing them to be a record of the past, to be the proof of veracity. In such a way, Zebald manipulates the past in a fashion similar to that of the Baroque predecessors. Throughout the entire book, the reader is left to unravel the level of reality to discover, as it is the case with many Baroque creations, where history ceases and the imaginary begins. The connection between Zebald's book and the Baroque aesthetics is not accidental. The Rings of Saturn is deeply connected with a curious work of the 17th century medic and philosopher Sir Thomas Brown. It is through both his works, Religio Medici and the urn burial, that Zabeld makes the constant, if not always explicit, dialogue with the Baroque aesthetics, as we can even say the Brown himself. Like Zabeld, Brown was an interdisciplinary man of letters, a medic, a philosopher, and even natural historian, who devoted one of his key works, the urn burial, to the ethnographic study of the same territory Zebald would use in his Rings of Saturn, the coast and regions of Norfolk. Beside other philosophical concepts present in Brown's work, the most momentous one is that of a thoroughly novel sense of space and time, which was left to our age as one of the most important legacies. Brown sees the concept of time as one inseparable temporal plane of eternal present, where different times and spaces coexist simultaneously. For him, as for Zebald, there is no past and no present. There is just one uninterrupted temporal continuum. And Zebald's book ought to be considered as a work of someone who deeply understood Baroque perception of the world, of the movements through space and time. The nature of transience. There is one quality, that of transience, which above all else makes Zabel's book utterly Baroque in its worldview. It deals beyond history, beyond time and space, with that perpetual Baroque subject, the fragility of human condition. Zabel sees transience formulated as destruction, violence, war, and terror in all forms that surround him, from the depths of the forests under the gentle heather hills beyond the last lights on the horizon, surfaces a shadow of past destructions. Such an image of history demonstrates the necessity of man's awareness of the past, of that ever-present merging of the temporal fragments that form our consciousness of the world. It shows, even further, the inevitable inseparability of life and death in the fabric of our existence. This coexistence of life and death in Zebald's book mirrors particularly Baroque obsession with our flickering nature. This concept is visible in the terrifyingly modern epitaph for the tomb of one of the most powerful men of Baroque age, Cardinal Antonio Barberini. Here lies body, ashes, and nothing. The idea of death as the end of one's time might seem quite uncommon for the 17th century. However, the entire notion of fatality was not singular to a few poets or highly educated individuals of the age, but formed an integral part 
of the then contemporary perception of dying, which was a very intricate one. It existed between two extremes. The death as annihilation was on one end, while the idea of good death stood at the other end of the scale. It was both the striking self-awareness of the reality of death and the Christian belief in the destruction of the body that brought on such complexity of feeling. Most of the reflections in the mirror of time held by Zabel in his book are those very meditations on the brevity of life and fragility of our mortal selves that populate the culture of the Baroque. The book both commences and ends with meditation on death and departure. It begins with Thomas Brownie's burial and ends with the departure of the soul also described by Brown in his book. Even the landscape Zabel's narrator walks through is the one of transience. The coast of Norfolk is among the most unstable ones on the British Isles, with its lime and sand structure constantly changing and escaping our perception, just like the life itself, like those slippery sands of Baroque hourglasses. Thus, the real and literary landscape in Zebald's Rings of Saturn become one, that of transience. In such a landscape, not only history evidences the past destructions, but the land itself is often the image of the slow decay which is inherent to the very substance of nature. And I quote, the history how that melancholy region came to be is closely connected not only with the nature of the soil and the influence of a maritime climate, but also far more decisively with the steady and advancing destructions that extend over British Isles." End of quote from Zebald. There almost could not be a vista in the rings of Saturn that is not the reminder of what was, or the object and the creation of man that was not subject to decay. Every seascape and crumbling wall, every abandoned house and the pile of driftwood, for Zebald are the invitation to the meditations on our own finity. It was indeed the Baroque age that first fully explored the landscape of destruction as one of the main visualization of the irreversible power of time. If one role of time was the paramount in that period, it was that of the great destroyer. The irreversible passage of time brought destruction and annihilation to the world, and it was most often represented through the images of wasteland, both in poetry and in the visual arts. One of the most important poets of the Baroque age, Griffius, wrote this, wherever you look, you see nothing but vanity on earth. What this one builds today will pull down tomorrow. The most fitting illustration of the wasteland of time's destruction, described such as Griffiths, can be seen in the work of a Neapolitan Baroque sculptor, Gaetano Zumbo, which we can see on the screen. He made a series of wax high relief works that depicted the landscapes of annihilation, where time, the great destroyer, reigned supreme. In his Triunfo del Tempo, The Triumph of Time, he represented this novel sense of transience for the Medici court in Florence in 1690. It is a high relief object that opens in front of the spectator an entire world of destruction. In the somber Teatro del Mondo, the allegory of Father Time draws the curtain and presents us with the landscape of the world swept by time. The scene of broken pillars and pediments dead bodies of men, women, and babies, dilapidated walls and withering plants trails into the infinite distance of the vista. Time as death spares nothing, not even the artist himself whose portrait lies under time's feet, as you can see. Also, it has been from the beginning of history, pyramids and Roman arches in the distance, tell us that even the greatest empires could not withstand the flight of time. Vivid intensity of both form and content of this work is greatly magnified by the medium it was executed in, the wax. Working in wax, 
had two important advantages. It was malleable, while its color and texture resembled human flesh. Images created in it were thus vivid, more lifelike, and thus more credible to the beholder. Furthermore, in this case, the usage of wax was more than appropriate. Its existence was ephemeral as life itself. But for Zebald, as well as for his Baroque predecessors, like Zumbo, destruction is not only visualized through allegory and images of the dying world. It was also connected with flame, smoke, and the concept of burning and annihilation that the fire stood for. It was Thomas Brown who wrote, life is pure flame and we live by an invisible sun within us. Brown's idea is not of burning as a brilliant shining of providence or the glow of divine creation, but that of self-destruction and of irreversible process of decay. The image of burning as smoke spoke eloquently through 17th century poetry and visual arts. For the Baroque poet Griffius, the man is just but a smoke on strong winds carried. And for his contemporary from Dubrovnik, Jivo Bunic, fire is a metaphor for human life. Let us remember that man's year on earth are tempest, fire, shadow, and mist, and nothing. The image of burning and smoke is very important also in Zebald's book, but he goes even further. He reminds us that the destruction of the world and of ourselves lies behind every principle existing, and I quote, like our bodies and like our desires, the machines we have devised are possessed of a heart which is slowly reduced to embers. From the earliest times, human civilization has been no more than the strange luminescence growing more intense by the hour, of which none can say when it will wane or when it will go away." End of quote. For Brown and Zebald and Zumbo, time is merciless in its unstoppable flight. Its passage spares and pardons none. Only the wasteland remains. As Zebald says, everything round about rots, decays, and sinks into the ground. There are only two seasons, the white winter and the green winter. In the white winter, everything is dead. During the green winter, everything is dying." End of quote. It is thus not surprising that Zebald closes his book with a reference to Brownie's treatise in the urn burial and the passage that describes the departing of the soul, not as a voyage to eternal glory, but as a somber ascent into nothingness. Same nothingness that Cardinal Barberini knew so well. And I quote, in the Holland of his time, it was customary in a home where there had been a death to drape black mourning ribbons over all the mirrors and all canvases depicting landscapes, people, or fruits of the field, so that the soul, as it left the body, would not be distracted on its final journey, either by a reflection of itself or by a last glimpse of the land, now being lost forever." End of quote from Zebald. By the end of His Rings of Saturn, a book of multiple travels, of perpetual going and leaving, this final voyage just becomes one of many. Thus, the Baroque sensibility towards death and time, towards this intertwining of beginnings and ends, in one infinite loop, precisely complements Zebel's travels through landscapes of history and destruction the landscape of forgotten pasts. There was one other rule that the 17th century culture endowed upon landscapes. They were the depository of collective memory. In that capacity, the landscape became the domain of dual time, where the seen and the remembered, or seen and constructed, constantly coexisted in one perpetual instant. The connection between nature and time which was so crucial for Zebald in his expression of landscape of destruction as the emblem of human fragility, has its deep roots in the perception of nature that was formulated back in the 17th century. In the age when one began, for the first time in the visual arts, to give the key role to the image of nature, landscape was one of the media 
from transporting complex conceptual content. Therefore, landscape was hardly ever a chosen fragment of nature, a privileged view. It was a significant vista enriched with respective political, religious, or philosophical ideas. It was ideological construct, but above all, a depository of different manifestations of temporality. In the Baroque visions of nature, as in Zebel's book, the times and spaces stood superimposed upon each other. The recorded view of nature served in the landscapes of Claude Lorraine, Nicolas Poussin, Aníbal Caracci, and other Baroque masters only as a stage of different temporal or spatial significations. While Claude and Poussin created landscapes that, that were, in their essence, the reflections of ideal world, or of a realm that never was. Their Dutch counterparts used their depictions of nature for far more mundane purposes, to express the patriotic delight over the land. Whether it was paradise or the land of patria they strove for, the, the countryside firmly remained in the domain of the conceptual. The Baroque time of nature thus, as the time in the rings of Saturn, was simultaneously the past and the present, the topography and memory depicted. Nature was used as a tool of evocation of enlivening the past, whether real or imaginary. Such interaction of the past and present is evident in those prospects of land that were made to remind the viewer of the possession that is now only belonging to memory. Zabel's use of landscape is also essentially one of evocation and sometimes even one of invocation. But it is not the land that matters, it is the past which it evokes. The reflections it engenders that is a key protagonist of Zabel's book. His recorded landscape serves as a literary and visual equivalent of memory. The memory that, like the one emerging from the visions of nature in the Baroque age, is never an individual subjective recollection, but a collective memory of the past, and I quote from Zebald. Footsore and weary as I was after my long walk from Loessoft, I sat down on the bench on the green called Gun Hill and looked out on the tranquil sea, from the depths of which the shadows were now rising. I felt as if I were in a deserted theater. I should not have been surprised if a curtain had suddenly risen before me on the proscenium and I had beheld that memorable day of 1672 where the Dutch fleet appeared offshore from uh, out of the drifting mists with a bright morning light behind it and open fire on the English fleet." End of quote. The memories of the past submerged are shattered and fragmentary, appearing in the rings of Saturn on the surface of the landscape and on the surface of the pages, vehemently like the changes of the coastal line of Norfolk. Moreover, the functioning of the remembrance itself, the very process of recollection, is crucial for the understanding of Zebel's book. Both its inner and outer structure recall the pattern of our own invocation of the past, whether personal or collective, real or imaginary. The discussion of the principle of remembering is reoccurring, like the memory itself, randomly but constantly throughout the rings of Saturn, and I quote, but the fact is that writing is the only way in which I'm able to cope with all the memories which overwhelm me so frequently, so unexpectedly. Memories lie slumbering within us for months and years, quietly proliferating, until they are woken by some trifle and in strange way blind us to life." End of quote. This very principle of recollection and the fickle nature of nature complement each other as they did centuries before in the Baroque images of land. The landscape and memory are truly united in that very nature of randomness in which they coexist with their own time. And the final chapter, the eternal present. Rings of Saturn is a collection of fragments, both in the conceptual and formal sense. The fragments of text and imagery are merged in the same way in which different times and spaces overlap in Zabel's narrative. The past and the present, 
do not exist for Sebald in the usual linear chronological sense. They inhabit a mutual space of eternal present, that particular atemporal domain already defined by Baroque philosopher Thomas Brown. There, we could say that Sebald's time is also Baroque time, the time that exists in temporal intersections of our presence and our past, forever captured in one atemporal instant. The Baroque age which, to which Brown belonged brought about new cosmological and geographical discoveries. It remapped the known and charted out a new world, offering, in exchange for the old dogmatic worldview, a new fragmentary universe. This new vision of the world was manifested in different visual regimes, in diverse illusionistic pictorial systems, in the striving for, for plurality, both spatial and temporal. One could say that the Baroque was the time of the eternal moment. It was the moment of action, and even more the moment of recollection and emotion. The captured instant is a leitmotif not only exemplified in Baroque attitude towards time, but also brought on a new relationship between the beholder and the sacred or profane space. The chosen instant was always a vivid, dramatic culmination of the represented narrative that for its very immediacy could establish a new psychological relation to the audience. The image of the captured moment, both in the visual arts and literature, ensure, ensured a more immediate response to the narrative presented and an easier identification with its content. One of the most striking visualizations of Brown's eternal present is not just one of the Baroque highly dramatic martyrdoms, nor a historical scene. It is this genre scene by El Greco called Boy Lighting an Amber, now in Capodimonte Museum in Naples. Perceived only on the level of the narrative, El Greco's painting seems fairly simple. A young boy is depicted at the moment of blowing on an amber to light up the candle he holds in his right hand. The image is steeped into darkness, and the only light illuminating the scene emanates from the glowing amber in the foreground. The whole image is highly naturalistic and heightens even more the feeling of presence evoked by the glowing light. The boy's face is full of serious concentration and solemnity that at first seems out of tune with the commonplace of the scene depicted. However, the action we are dealing is a highly complex one. El Greco represents the movement which seems like a total absence of motion. He depicts a scene that lasts a fraction of a second, but looks like an illustration of eternity. It is an image where time looks suspended, almost annihilated. At the same time, the painter tells us that the motion we perceive is a conceptual perpetuum mobile. The air boy produces to create light also makes him visible to us. Invisible air produces visible light in the same way that stillness engenders motion. Here, the action and visibility are dependent upon each other. El Greco thus depicts a double time, the swift, almost barely noticeable fraction of a second that the initial action of lighting a candle lasts, but also the very same moment suspended and turned into timelessness. He plays on a very ambiguous border, between visible and invisible, between the movement and its suspension, in order to treat more profound issues of time, duration, and transience. Zabel's narrator is not unlike this El Greco's boy. To him only the moment belongs, the moment that is at once the past and the present, the action and the recollection. And I quote from Zabel. There are indeed moments as one passes through the rooms open to the public of Sommer Litten, when one is not quite sure whether one is in a country house in Suffolk or some kind of no man's land on the Arctic Ocean." End of quote. Zebert's protagonist is thus similar to a Baroque man who, standing on the stage of the world, witnesses simultaneously in one single instant 
the passage of different segments of real or imaginary history, the imagery of pasts lost or pasts forgotten. He is walking along the coast of Norfolk, also poised on the crossroads of time and encounters those shutters of the past whose perpetual ambulations form the fragmentary landscape of our own present. The aesthetic response to the new conception of space as interminable is visible in the diverse visual forms in Baroque, but it is at its most poignant in the illusionistic representations of infinite spaces that decorate the ceilings and domes of Baroque palaces and churches. Such unification of different temporal and spatial entities is the most elaborate in this hall of mirrors, which is in Villa Pelagonia, a Baroque masterpiece in Sicily. Built in 1715 by one of the richest princes in Sicily, this villa offers a profoundly novel understanding of fragmented temporal and spatial realms. Upon entrance to the Hall of Mirrors, situated at the Piano Nobile of the villa, a curious space of multiple realities opens up in front of the spectator. Upon the walls of the room, an imaginary Arcadian garden revolves, while the vast ceiling is entirely covered with pieces of mirrors of different sizes. On all the walls of the Hall of Mirrors and on the bottom part of the mirrored ceiling, the artist created a fanciful pastoral world full of fantastic plants and birds, while through the windows of the salon, the view opens on one of the most lavish gardens of the period. There is no longer a border between imagination and reality, between Arcadian world and one of our own. Upon entering this room, the spectator discovers a curious polycentric world, not unlike Zebald's, that is complexity of different imagery and different realms. And I quote from Zebald, although in my dream I was sitting transfixed with amazement in the Chinese pavilion, I was at the same time out in the open, within a foot from the very edge of the cliff, and knew how fearful it is to be where I am." End of quote. Beholding this marvelous of Villa Pelagonia, the beholder is, if only for an instant, offered a glimpse of the ideal world, while viewing the multiple visions of himself in the glittering mirrors of the ceiling, he literally participates in that eternal present the real and the fictional, have been multiplied to infinity, expanding to the furthest corners of his fields of vision. Like in Zebald's landscapes, the spectator or reader does not sense any longer the confines of reality, only the limitless world which is both the past and the present. The principle of eternal present is ultimately manifested in the rings of Saturn through the movement of the main protagonist and the reader through the narrative. And that voyage is personified through the image of silk and the act that weaving that stands as a constant, although almost invisible, leitmotif of the book. At its beginning, the reader is informed that Brown's father was a silk merchant, while Zabel devotes the last chapter to the story of the silk production in East Anglia. The weaving and spinning of the silk thus becomes a perfect metaphor for the rings of Saturn. All the past and all the presents, all our fears and our desires are united in one continuous thread that is unraveling in front of us, just like the irreversible thread of time or the thread of the life itself. Thank you. <laughs>